Well, thanks again, Dave, for uh, organizing this. It's uh, such a such a great meeting. Uh, just rolling through the organizations that uh, have uh, guidelines. The AUA has not updated uh, in the last two years and uh, sort of the hallmark of their uh, guideline is shared decision-making, you know, for that group of uh, patients in ERSPC for whom a benefit was shown. EAU uh, does uh, update every year and uh, the new bullet here is in the, uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow, they, uh, changed the uh, yeah, perfect. classification of uh, you know men carrying BRCA2 mutations, start screening and put that in the strong uh, evidence group. Uh, they maintain this risk adapted uh, uh, strategy and uh, have pushed out the uh, interval of follow-up up to eight years. It previously had been in the four to five year uh, range. Uh, They've uh, commented, and I know your talk, Dave, uh, will uh, hit on the use of additional serum and urine-based uh, markers uh, to avoid a biopsy for men who have uh, an abnormal PSA. They've classified the evidence for the markers as weak. And there's a lot of uh, comments about um, MRI. Obviously, uh, they, they would... Uh, promote a uh, targeted biopsy, but they're also recommending a systematic biopsy at the same time, even uh, of uh, parts of the prostate that are normal on the MRI. If the MRI is negative, again, uh, they've invoked uh, the use of shared decision-making and markers uh, in an effort to omit a biopsy for a man uh, with uh, an otherwise elevated PSA strength of that uh, being uh, considered in the weak uh, category. I know we're gonna have a lot more discussion on MRI later. These are the markers that uh, EAU uh, considered uh, potentially useful uh, to guide biopsy decisions. You can see them here. Now the uh, NCCN updates guidelines uh, every year. Uh, there's really uh, not a lot of change on uh, this uh, flow diagram uh, here. Uh, the one uh, big change is uh, in this uh, step, uh, that is to consider biomarkers that improve the specificity of screening. And if you blow that uh, footnote up, uh, they've now considered uh, free PSA, XODX, PHI, OPCO 4K, PCA3, and the new uh, addition is select MDX as a uh, valid uh, test that is potentially informative uh, to uh, guide uh, biopsy and rebiopsy decisions. Uh, and again, uh, sort of like the EAU are invoking uh, the use of uh, biomarkers in the setting of a man with an abnormal PSA, but a negative uh, MRI to determine uh, if a biopsy is warranted. There's a couple of other organizations that have guidelines as well, and they're not, uh, they haven't really been updated. So I really won't spend any time on that. I do think uh, we ought to discuss this later on. Uh, you know, this uh, editorial or I'm not sounding board, I'm not sure exactly what it was that appeared a couple months ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, you know, basically uh, said that screening uh, really may not be that good. And I think we can all agree with that. Uh, but uh, this section here kind of rankled me, and it says, if you're going to screen anyway, uh, that uh, you've got to adjust uh, what we've been doing in the past. And okay, I, I agree with that. But what they are recommending, I've highlighted here, is a higher biopsy threshold would not only reduce overdiagnosis, it would also reduce the number of biopsies and the associated harms, either of the biopsy or the downstream effects. And they came up with a recommendation to, for generalists, this approach simply requires a higher PSA threshold for referral to urology, say, of 10 nanograms per milliliter. And I just think this is crazy. Uh, they sort of justify that uh, with a couple of arguments, but one of it is uh, just on a proportion of the population basis uh, that... Uh, the approximate proportion of patients 
who have a PSA of over 10 is very similar to uh, the proportion of men expected to die of prostate cancer in the next 10 years. To me, that seems absolutely ludicrous. And uh, I really wonder if we couldn't uh, generate a response to this. I mean, because everybody knows that your, your odds of dying of prostate cancer are directly, in, in, for every age group, are directly related to the PSA at the time that your uh, uh, prostate cancer is discovered. And I think that waiting for a PSA of 10, it's, it's gonna be too late. So uh, I would say that uh, one of the goals I'd like to have for this meeting is, is to uh, issue a response uh, to that uh, statement. And uh, this is uh, how I would uh, like to see early detection uh, improved. Uh, I think we need to identify better which men are at above average risk for significant cancer. Yes, there's early in life PSA and there are some of these SNP tests. I think uh, this is right out of Crawford's uh, talk from a year or so ago. Patients and physicians need a simple message and that is a lower PSA threshold for referral, not a higher threshold. We need to identify patients with clinically significant cancer earlier. So a lower threshold is one way and a better biopsy is another way. We, we need to reduce unnecessary initial and repeat biopsies. We're gonna hear a lot about biomarkers. We're gonna hear a lot about imaging, whether it's MRI or the exact view uh, ultrasound. And finally, uh, the final piece is uh, enhance the risk stratification for men who are discovered to have cancer uh, tumor uh, genomic uh, profiling. So I, I would uh, conclude my uh, remarks there. Uh, happy to have any uh, discussion uh, down the road on this. And uh, Lenny, thanks for including me. And David, uh, thanks as well.